Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. I get a lot of questions about crop rotation. That is, do I always have to grow something different in the same spot? And the answer is, well, it's complicated. So I'll give you that answer and then talk a bit about how all this relates to crop rotations on our certified organic farm, where we have to, by regulation, demonstrate some sort of crop rotation to our inspectors every year, even when it's weird. It's a hoot. So let's do it. Maybe the coldest I've ever been shooting a video. Okay, so one of the first things you hear when you start growing food is that you should rotate your crops. And that's pretty much been the advice for centuries in many parts of the world. Uh, and to some extent, for good reason, people over time have observed that when you plant a crop in the same place, season after season, you can run into disease and pest issues, plus lower yields. Therefore, they tried to avoid repeating the crops and crop families so if someone had a disease or pest issue in a bed, they wouldn't want to plant that same crop family there the next year. But if they didn't have a pest or disease issue, they might also not want to risk getting that disease. In effect, they may as well move that crop just to be safe. Hence, rotation. And that seems perfectly logical on the surface. But why now is that all of a sudden sort of being challenged? The first reason, and maybe the primary reason, is simply necessity. A lot of people, including perhaps many of you, don't have enough space to grow their tomatoes or whatever in a different spot every single season. And I'm not just talking about backyard gardeners. Many farmers, including myself, only have so much tunnel space to be able to dedicate to something like tomatoes. So that is one reason that this idea of crop rotation is being challenged. Essentially, people are asking, I know it's recommended, but do I have to do it? Do I have to rotate? So that's part of it, uh, if not the entire engine behind this question, because if everyone had all the space that they needed and farmland wasn't being gobbled up by the wealthy for tax breaks or by neighborhood developers or by grocery store chains so that they can move right across the street from themselves, then maybe no one would really be pushing to understand if crop rotation is an absolute necessity. However, there is another part of this query, uh, a nerdier part, but it takes a little explaining. Basically, Soil biology, I don't know if I can say the word biology. Basically, soil biology is becoming more and more understood, or at least more and more appreciated. And we know that crops gather novel colonies of microbes to their root systems and that are specific to the crop's needs. Uh, it's sort of like the plants are able to call in the types of workers that they need to feed and protect their roots. So the logical question is perhaps, if plants are curating the microbes that they want in the soil beneath them, which is a thing, why would we not then plant that exact same crop in that exact same place again and again to take advantage of the conditions that crop has created? Like that broccoli crop spent all that time gathering microbes specific to its needs. Why place a totally different crop family in there and start that whole process over again, right? Like, wouldn't the soil in that case be set up to feed more brassicas? It's a reasonable question. Moreover, if you're using good, healthy soil practices, diseases shouldn't be as much of an issue, right? So I want to look at what the research says about this, but because I don't like to waste anyone's time, dad jokes notwithstanding, I'll start with my general answer to the question of should you rotate crops? And then the super nerds can stick around for some of the interesting scientific tidbits. So according to the science, should you rotate? And the answer is generally yes. It is a reasonable idea to rotate your crops in an organic farming system for yield and soil health and disease resistance. Some studies show, for instance, even plants that didn't look diseased may still harbor specific diseases in large quantities on their roots, which could proliferate the next season. In effect, rotation is just reasonably good insurance. So generally speaking, my recommendation is rotate if you can, and if you can't, like you don't have the space, try to plant as diversely as you can alongside the crops that are not being rotated so you can increase biodiversity in the soil to help fend off diseases and improve overall soil health and adding good healthy composts. Look to the Living Soil Handbook for guidance on those good soil practices, which notably when you get it from notillgrowers.com helps support videos like this. So that's neat. And if that's all you needed, hit the like button and hit the subscribe button, and we'll see you later. But for the rest of you nerds, I should say that that answer I just gave is not without nuance, because not every rotation is beneficial to the incoming crop, and there are other things that spread and harbor diseases and pests other than soil. So with that in mind, are you ready for it to get a little nerdy in here? Out here? In here? Greenhouse? Perhaps obviously most of the research around crop rotation is on corn and soybeans and small grains. The bulk of the research that I could find on vegetables was specific to tomatoes, but there are some other smaller crop studies that are interesting and a lot of studies on specific diseases, which is helpful as well. 
I read a dozen studies or more on crop rotation, but the best and easiest reading you can do yourself is this Sarah publication that I will link in the show notes with all the rest of the studies that helped guide this video, as I typically do. Uh, check that out. It is a really good primer on crop rotation generally. Okay, so interesting point number one. Not all rotations are created equal, and not all rotations are beneficial. For instance, there was a six-year study out of China that looked at the effects of tomato crop rotations on fungal populations and diversity in soil. Basically, they rotated tomatoes with each beans, cabbage, and celery, and then compared that with a continuous cropping for tomatoes, so tomatoes after tomatoes. Interestingly, the cabbage and bean rotations reduced the fungal diversity the most. Then the continuous cropping had a comparatively higher fungal richness, but in that diversity was included a handful of harmful pathogens where they grew tomatoes after tomatoes. Rotating tomatoes with celery seemed to be the winner in this particular study as it increased fungal diversity the most. Uh, effectively breaking up tomato production with celery seemed to be a good idea, though logistically I have no idea how you would throw a celery crop into a tomato rotation because celery and tomatoes both take forever to grow, but nice finding. It's worth noting that there's a somewhat wild amount of antagonism, as wild as researchers get, I guess, in some papers to the idea that one rotation is better than another. One paper looked at 149 studies and found, quote, there appears to be no consistent scientific basis to justify the use of a particular crop rotation over another. And that's just like a zinger in scientific terms, uh, basically suggesting there are a lot of claims out there about which crops should come before which other crop, but not a lot of science to back those claims up. Also in that vein, I found some research that challenged the idea that rotating distant crop families was better than rotating more closely related crop families. For instance, in one trial, four crops belonging to four different families were grown in a rotation of potato, followed by an Italian ryegrass, fodder beet, maize, then Brussels sprouts, and the success of the fodder beet actually declined year over year in this diverse rotation. In other words, it wasn't necessarily better in this instance to grow the most unrelated crops possible. Yet another paper I found studied tomatoes in rotation with 36 different plants some closely related to the tomatoes and others not so much, and found that relatedness did not necessarily predict tomato performance. The plant with the most negative effect on the tomatoes, uh, and warning, high tunnel growers, you're about to face palm, so I guess get a helmet or something, but the crop with the most negative effect on tomatoes was cucumbers. So if you're like me, swapping those two crops back and forth in your tunnels, well, it may be worth rethinking that rotation. There are a lot of these little studies that effectively just muddy the water on crop rotation, but I, I want to mention a couple other points on crop rotation worth considering. First, rotations can help with pests by interrupting their life cycles, but that's obviously not a guarantee because it depends on the pest. And in fact, for both pests and diseases, the researchers often remind the reader to know the life cycle of the disease or pest that you're trying to fight. In other words, if the pest crawls or flies long distances, rotation is only going to help so much. Same with something like powdery mildew, which can and does literally travel from Florida to Maine every season on the wind. So it is going to travel across your farm if you're not keeping up with your soil health and protecting your crops properly. Also, not all diseases are specific to a single crop family. Phytophthora capisci, for instance, also sometimes referred to as whatever the correct pronunciation is. Anyway, that can infect peppers cucurbits, and lima beans. So three basically unrelated plants, which is fun when it comes to rotations. So a rotation is only going to go so far. Moreover, plants are not the only pests and disease vectors. So you may be like, man, I got to rotate my tomatoes next year because of X disease. But then you also rotate with it the landscape fabric that you used or the stakes uh, or the string or whatever, potentially rotating the issue along with that crop. So, effectively, sanitation of your trellising equipment can be really important, especially if diseases are becoming an issue. And so if you've watched up until now and you're like, okay, well, now I'm even more confused, me too! Of course, one obligatory note here that when looking at scientific papers on farming, they are not generally rules you have to follow, but the research gives you suggestions of what might or might not work. Especially with something as dynamic as soil, research results can vary farm to farm and farmer to farmer. Use science like an arrow pointing you in one direction or another, or sometimes in every direction, as the crop rotation science seems to do a little bit. 
But here's what I'll reiterate. Diverse plantings are generally good and crop rotation is generally beneficial to soil health. And if you're following good soil management practices, diseases and pests should just generally be less of an issue. That's kind of what it all comes down to observing what crops don't do as well and what rotations is also probably going to be important. Crop rotations, as an idea, have probably garnered a bit too much credit, but at the same time, they're not generally a bad idea either. So now, real quick, let's talk about what learning all of this means on my farm for this season. First, I've discussed this before, but we largely divide our farm between slow rotation crops and fast or high rotation crops. A slow rotation crop would be like potatoes or tomatoes. A high rotation crop would be like lettuce or tomatoes. So Diversity in the fast rotation crops is quite high with some beds being as many as four or five crop families in a single year. That said, I am often planting the same crop in the same bed within 12 months. So like this bed will see lettuce again in 2024 at some point, but it will also have probably seen something like four or five other crops in between those two. So that's a really extreme rotation. And sometimes there's some interplanting going on. So there's a lot of biodiversity there just to keep up the biodiversity in the soil in case one of those microbes will help at a later date for a disease. Also, these are shallow rooted crops those roots are going to decompose and move through a cycle a lot faster than crops with really deep roots, like tomatoes, for instance. In the slow rotation plots, where disease buildup is perhaps more likely because these crops are in the ground so long, we often keep them on a three-year rotation at minimum. So the garlic will not be grown in the same plot for at least three more years. We also bookend most plantings with a cover crop. Is three years necessary? I have no idea, especially after reading through all the research, but I do know that since I have the space, three years doesn't seem to hurt anything. And this all fits into organic certification requirements to demonstrate a crop rotation because, well, crops are obviously being rotated thoughtfully throughout. The tunnels are where it gets a little tricky. I've been rotating tomatoes and cucumbers, but now I'm wondering if some of the issues I've seen in the production of both of those crops may be attributable to that specific cucumber tomato rotation. What I'm going to try is to designate two tunnel beds for a cucurbit rotation and two tunnel beds for tomatoes to be able to rotate these crops between only their two tunnel beds and then obviously trying to maintain good soil practices. The idea being that basically that tomato bed will see tomatoes every other year. Some growers go as far as to steam their tunnel beds instead of rotate them, and it is effective at killing pathogenic microbes, but also beneficial ones to boot. And the soil microbiome will not necessarily recover the same diversity according to studies. In fact, from what I can tell, the microbiome, the original microbiome before the steaming does not recover. It will grow a different microbiome, but it will not have that same diversity and the same microbes. In fact, the microbes that are more resilient to heat tend to proliferate after the steaming because they just survived the steaming more. And I just feel like we do so much work on our soil life, I would hate to throw any of that away. But I'm not going to judge anyone for doing it that way. Obviously, it can't work and growing space is expensive and hard to get your hands on and steam is better than chemical drenches. So there's that. Uh, anyway, I have no idea if all that was helpful or not to you, but it was interesting and fun to explore for me. Uh, so like this video if you like this video. If you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Snag a copy of the Living Soil Handbook or other merch like a hat from notillgrowers.com where the proceeds go to making you more videos and me spending hours and hours reading research so I can drop bombs like don't rotate cucumbers and tomatoes. You can also support our work by joining our Patreon page at patreon.com slash notillgrowers or just hit that super thanks button. That works too. Otherwise, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. I can um, barely feel my fingers. I guess maybe next time I should just buy the whole glove. <laughs>